Uh, you know, everyone has a vital part in God's work, and so I'm so thankful for everyone. Um, just uh, like to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. Hebrews chapter 10. About two or three weeks ago, we talked about why church is essential in our life. Church is essential in our country. Church is essential in our society. Now, uh, rather than taking a, a maybe political approach or a, a legal approach, um, we've taken more of a spiritual approach, though, and focused, uh, focused upon the spiritual necessity of what God's invention is that is called the church. And the church, we've uh, uh, realized, is a safe haven, a harbor for our weary souls in this evil world. The church is a refuge where we find peace and comfort and safety as we focus upon Jesus Christ and assemble together in God's presence. The church is a house of God. We also recognize how the church is the house of truth, or at least it's supposed to be. And most of all, we've talked about how the church is the house of prayer. And, um, you know, prayer is uh, or ought to be a central part of every church's activities and of every single Christian's life. We were talking uh, uh, about different things on Thursday evening, and once again, encourage you to uh, check out that message on Facebook if you missed it. But um, we were recognizing how it is actually Christians who historically and throughout the Scripture, it has been Christians who have excelled under difficulty and under pressure and under opposition. And you find that throughout Scripture, you find that throughout history, many times during the most difficult of times, sometimes even during the most severe of persecutions, it was Christians that were on fire for the Lord, that were revived. It was Christians that um, were so much the more closer to God during the difficult times. And I believe that is because God, as His children, has given you and me an innate resilience that the rest of this world, for example, does not have. And that is the grace of God. And we've talked about on Thursday how this grace of God, as Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 teaches us, needs to, needs to be accessed, needs to be um, received by prayer. And so prayer is an essential part for, for, in regards to what it means to be a Christian, and the church is supposed to be a house of prayer. Amen? And because of all of these things and many more, the church is so essential but this morning, I'd like to ask the question, what do I need my church for? What do I need my church for? You know, if I would make the claim this morning that your faithfulness to church is essential for you as well, you might want to ask, well, why? What's the point? Um, what is the purpose and what is the benefit of um, me being part of my church and of me being faithful uh, to what God wants to do with this local family of God. And I believe there in Hebrews chapter 10 to chapter 13, we see several points, several reasons uh, that we can see our church is good for us and accomplishes in our life and why it's essential that you and I are part of it. You say, well, I'd love to be, but, you know, right now we're under COVID-19 restrictions and we're not able to. And you know what? That's why we need to pray even so much the more. And not just that, though. The question is, where's my heart? You know? And uh, I just realized as, as we, we go through um, uh, these uh, ups and downs of this 2020 year, <laughs> I think we need to go back to the basics. And I think we need to just uh, maybe remind ourselves about what is important and why. Amen. And so that's where, in regards to the church, we want to answer some of that question. Would you agree with me that food is important? Amen. 
Wow, I was expecting some hearty Baptist amens here. <laughs> amen. <clears throat> Food is important, amen. Amen, it sure is, amen. Now, don't you go to gluttony, all right? The holidays are coming up, but... Uh, at the same time, I mean, thank God for food, amen? Thank God, especially that we're blessed in such a pros prosperous corner of the world where, you know, for the most part, we really do not have to worry what we're going to put in our fridge. And, um, and if that is a concern, by all means, we'd love to help, all right? And I mean that. And so please reach out, all right? There's no shame in that. Um, but food though, is so important for our survival, isn't it? Nobody would question that food is essential. Well, why is that? Well, because there's nutrition in our food, right? And they keep us alive. They nourish our physical body. And this morning, I'd like to look at some spiritual nutrition, though. And, um, you know, there's several different food groups that they've uh, identified, right? Um, and this morning, I'd like to um, basically illustrate with each of these food groups a spiritual point in regards to how... My faithfulness to church is essential in my life, just like these nutritions would be for my body, all right? And the, the first one I'd like to start off with, I have this wonderful little bag here that I got all my goodies in. Um, and so the first one I'd like to start off with is um, fruit, all right? Who likes fruit? All right, if you like fruit, uh, raise your hand online, all right? <laughs> Put it in the chat, whatever works. Um, I love apples. Out of strawberries, raspberries, grapes, all that stuff, even more. And I, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of fruit, mainly because it's usually fairly easy to eat, and it's sweet, and it's even healthy, right? It's, uh, it's tasty, juicy, whatever. And so fruit is, is a very good nutrition for us, right? And um, there are some things in our life in regards to the church that keep us healthy spiritually, that uh, make our life as Christian enjoyable, just like, you know, I, I, I love, you know, just digging through this, this nice fresh apple, you know. And um, uh, um, I want to point these things out to you this morning from the book of Hebrews. It's starting there in chapter 10 and verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. And I want to compare the area of fruit in our physical nutrition to fellowship and faithfulness in regards to the church. Fellowship and faithfulness. Just like fruit keeps me healthy and is an enjoyable uh, nutrition, food uh, to consume, faith, fellowship and faithfulness keep me spiritually healthy and make the Christian life more enjoyable. And we see that there in Hebrews 10 verse 23 where it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful, that promise. Well, who's that referring to? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? And um, notice, though, it says that we ought to hold fast our profession of our faith. Now, how do you hold something slow? That's not what this is talking about here, all right? It's not talking about speed. It is talking about like you would fasten a nail, for example, all right? So hold firm, hold fixed, hold unmovable your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer we find in Scripture needs the church so he can remain steadfast and faithful in his faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, who reminds me that my labor is not in vain in the Lord when I forget sometimes? When I sometimes feel, well, maybe it is, though. Who reminds me of that? Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the teaching and preaching that I receive from the Word of God in the church... And so we find that in order for me to be faithful, for me to be successful as a Christian throughout all of my life, it is so important for me to be faithful to church. I was thinking about the Apostle Paul. And you know, at the end of his life, he said, I have finished my course. I've run my race. 
And he was firmly expecting that crown, uh, uh, that reward from the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he had served with his life. Did he never get discouraged? Did he never feel like quitting? Sure he did. Sure he did. He sometimes felt like he had plenty of reasons to quit. And um, we find, though, that throughout his life, right from the very first days of him being saved, um, he had a very close relationship to church. And, you know, as soon as he moved from Damascus to Jerusalem, what was the first thing that he did? He sought out the believers. He joined himself to that local church. As soon as God moved him from Antioch to, uh, excuse me, from, from Jerusalem to, um, well, to Tyrus, uh, he joined the believers there. And, and, you know, to Antioch, he immediately became part of that church. Wherever the Apostle Paul went, he immediately sought out the believers. He knew that on his own, he would not last long. And he needed that collective strength, that encouragement of the believer. And you know, in Acts 20, verse 24, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count of my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify of the grace of God. How did he do that? How did he continue so steadfastly? Well, we find consistently throughout his Christian life, he's always been very closely connected and very faithful to the church wherever he was at. Maybe there's something for us to learn. Amen. Well, most definitely there is. And Hebrews chapter 10 clearly bears that out. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 16, where we see a very clear warning of something that could happen to each and every one of us as Christians. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. Um, uh, or verse 17, really. We, we see here how there's some that rest, uh, that, that uh, oppose and, and doubt the Scriptures. And then verse 17 goes on to say, Ye therefore, beloved, so in contrast to that, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. There's nothing in this world that you or I, even as a Christian, would not be capable of doing. If we think any different, we're deceiving ourselves. We obviously have not fully understand who we are and how much we're dependent upon Christ. Um, um, and, uh, and so you and I are capable to be caught up in the error of the wicked, to be deceived and um, to uh, turn against God or turn even against the church of God if we're not careful. How can I remain faithful? By being involved in God's church, by that fellowship and that faithfulness in, uh, uh, with the family of God. Steadfastness, that word means a firmness of mind or purpose, a constancy. In other words, if I as a Christian, just like the Apostle Paul as we saw in Acts there, if I want to live, uh, keep a consistent, uh, consistency in my life, if I want to keep a consistency in my life, um, I need to make sure that I have as a focus in my life to worship together with the family of God. I was thinking how to illustrate the importance of our faithfulness to God's program and God's agenda that He has in the church. And, you know, I was thinking about my vehicle. And, and church is, is, in a sense, like the oil in your transmission. You know, if your transmission is lacking oil, I mean, things will start to bust. Things will, things will not work well. <laughs> and you probably won't go very fast for anywhere. If you lack air in your tires, you won't go very fast anywhere neither. Some of these very basic components that are so, dare I say, essential, I think could be easily compared as a picture to how God views the need and necessity of our church family in our life. Um, without it, you will not get very far. And without it, you will not drive very consistently. <laughs> Ever tried to drive with, with, with no air in a tire? It's not a good idea. 
It's the Lord's desire that as Christians we stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The Lord encourages us in Philippians 1 verse 27. And so I want us to recognize here this morning that there is no such a concept in the Bible as this Lone Ranger Christian. Well, I can still worship God at home. Yes, of course you can still worship God at home. But you'll only get half the deal. You'll have air only in one or two of your tires. You're, 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 you're missing part of your diet. Sure, you can just you know, live on potatoes and bread or whatever. But you know what? It won't be very healthy in the long term for you. You'll need some fruit once in a while. Amen? And preferably several times a week. Amen? <clears throat> you know, they say an apple A keeps a doctor away. Now, there's obviously way more to that than this, but maybe we could relate that to, you know, several times church a week keeps the devil away. <laughs> Amen? Um, no, it'll take a little bit more than that, but you get the idea. Verse 24, as we go back to Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, just, just keep your finger in there as we, we flip back and forth so you can easily find back. Um, and uh, I should do the same. <laughs> um, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. We see how the believer is in great need of f uh, the fellowship with other believers. Hebrews 10 verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now that's going to be very hard to do if I'm just all by my own all the time. And you see, that is, that is part of the difficulty of this whole virtual on, uh, church only. It's, it's uh, very unnatural for us as Christians. And, um, you know, we want to be prudent, and we most definitely want to be uh, considerate of anyone uh, that is uh, under health risk and that is um, under danger of uh, the, the uh, contracting COVID and so forth. And we definitely want to be prudent. We definitely want to take care of everyone that is vulnerable. But at the same time also, we have to, maybe more than ever before, make sure we have the right kind of diet. Especially, as a, spiritually speaking, as Christians. Amen? And that's impossible without that getting together, that gathering of the saints, where we can consider one another where we can encourage one another, edify one another, and, and, and provoke, that means to, to, to motivate, to, to prod, so to speak, to not anger, not bitterness, not griping, not gossip, <laughs> but to love and good works, amen? And can I be honest with you? Many times, the accountability that I have towards you as my church family will keep me in my Bible more, will keep me praying more will maybe make me think twice before I do this or that foolish idea or sin in my life. And, and, and so we, we need to encourage and provoke one another to make sure on the straight and, to stay on the straight and narrow. Amen? Romans 12 says that we, that we being many are one body in Christ and every one members of one another. Notice, we, we often think, well, we're, we're members of Christ's body, and we sure are. But what we often forget is that this also involves that I'm a member of you and you're a member of me. And so we are part of one another as such spiritually. Why is the fellowship, the getting together, the assembling of God's children so important? Well, because one of the things we need to do when we get together is what 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says. It says, we're for comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And um, we see in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I'll just refer that to you, you can look up those verses yourself, how uh, two are better than one. <laughs> Amen? And, you know, if you have more than two, even the better. <laughs> uh, you know, for if they, they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. And you know what? You and I are perceptible to falling 
spiritually each and every day. And we need to pick one another back up. And especially when we have to be so separated, like during this pandemic, even so much the more we have to reach out. And you know, can I be honest with you? I hate calling on the phone. I, I don't like texting. I, that's just not me. I, uh, unless I can see your face, I, I really don't want to talk with people. But I have to, because we need one another. We need one another. Amen? We need to reach out one to another. And um, the Bible goes on to say, if one prevail against him, two you shall withstand him. And so we're in this fight together, and we depend upon another just like you would depend upon an essential part of a healthy diet. Hey, Amen? Um, I want to move on to the next food that I'd like to consider. We, we see that fruit is, is what keeps us healthy or keeps our diet enjoyable in many parts. And I'd like to compare that to our, um, our, our uh, fellowship and our faithfulness to the church. But another thing that we need is veggies. Amen? <laughs> My wife, she loves carrots a lot. <laughs> um, and um, vegetables are very healthy. Amen, children? <laughs> right? Uh, some of my children love veggies, and others just can't stand them, and so they both have to learn how to eat them. Amen? Um, and um, vegetables are, are, you know, good fiber, for example. They're a vital part of a healthy digestion, and um, they really help us to keep moving forward. You know, if, if we're, we're, we're lacking fiber, for example, eventually our, our system will get clogged in a sense. And things will just not keep moving forward anymore. And there's things uh, that are likened to that of, uh, area of vegetables in our physical diet in our spiritual life. And that is number two, our, the safety and security that we find in the church. The safety and security. What do I mean by that? Well, for one, there is uh, a special... A uh, blessing, a special net of safety, a safe haven that we find as we get together and assemble as the church. Let's keep reading there in Hebrews 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10, verse 25. It says there, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, so much the more, as you see, the day approaching. Why is this so important to do this rather the more instead of the less as we see what they approaching? Well, the day of Jesus Christ, the day of judgment. Because the days are evil. And you know, it's no secret how the Bible prophesies that they're getting more and more evil. <laughs> and so, Ephesians 5 tells us that we need to walk circumspectly. It means prudent, wise, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And you know why are the days evil? Well, very simply, because the enemy never sleeps. And he is out to quench the fire of our spiritual uh, life and our personal walk with God in each and every one of us. And that's why we need to keep up the flames together. And because the days are getting more and more evil, and Christianity, or, or rather Christ, I should say, is less and less accepted and welcomed. And, and you know, the, the moral principles of the Word of God seem to be further and further away from the, um, the, the common um, attitude in our society. We rather should get together and encourage and strengthen one another so much the more, not less as we see Christ's return approaching. The enemy never sleeps. Did you know that every day Satan has a plan for your life? But, but so does God. God has a plan for you each and every day too. And so that's why it's so important that we know, that we love, and that we live out the will of God for my life each and every day. Part of that will of God for my life without doubt is the follow the command of Scripture to meet together with God's family. It 
why is the church such a safe haven? If you look just a little further in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 24, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, we see an illustration there from good old Moses from the Old Testament. In Hebrews 11, verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Notice verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. We need some more firm Bible believers that fear not the wrath of the king, that are willing to forsake Egypt, which is a picture in Scripture of the system and philosophy of this God-rejecting world. And we need to be willing to rather take that stance of separation and be willing to, even if it means to suffer affliction and to reproach, to take a stand and identify with the people of God instead. Because that is where we find that safe haven. What a powerful picture Moses is, amen? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. And so we see though also in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 that the church is not just that safety, that, that harbor, uh, uh, excuse me, haven, um, where we find that spiritual safety and, and that helps us to um, keep on the straight and narrow and to keep that, that, uh, that identification with God's people instead of identifying with the people and philosophy uh, of this world, we also see, though, the aspect of security. And what I'm talking about specifically is in regards to my salvation. Did you know that one evidence of salvation of every new believer is that they have a desire to meet with the people of God? Every true, truly born-again new Christian that I've ever seen and one of their first questions was immediately, what church should I go to? Where can I find other believers to fellowship with? That is a natural desire that the Holy Spirit of God will give into every new child of the Lord. Once again, look at the Apostle Paul. Within days, he, transferred, uh, he transformed excuse me, from the greatest persecutor of Christians to the one who sought them out, even when they were trying to run away from him. Um, there in Jerusalem. In Hebrews chapter 12, I want to read verse 28. Hebrews 12, verse 28. Wherefore, be receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You know what? Uh, when there's a Christian that does not have the natural desire to serve God and live out His will in regards to the church, there, there's great concern. There's great concern. Why is there not that natural longing and desire of the Holy Spirit in this person? Are they really saved? Faithfulness to the house of God and uh, to the things of God is one of the evidences of a believer's salvation. Let's look into Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 2. Hebrews chapter, no, let, let's read verse 1 as well. Hebrews chapter 12 verse, verse 1, where we see that new perspective of every saved person. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's referring to the Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11, um, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You cannot be a Christian without having started that race with Christ. Um, that, that's part of the deal. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see that theme there, that similarity to what Moses did? Notice verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You know, sometimes we think we have it really tough. Sometimes we think, oh, we're just suffering so awfully, and this is just all not so fair, and oh, oh. And you know what? I'm not trying to diminish anybody's hurt or difficulty. Not at all. I'm not trying to be disrespectful at all. But the fact of the matter is, I think sometimes we really forget how spoiled we are, how good we still have it. For example, I believe it's, it's, it's a miracle of God that we are still have a building available where we can safely still uh, broadcast the services right now. Uh, there's so many other churches who don't have that right now. It, 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 you know, I'm so thankful for, that we have the, the, the resources and the finances and the technology and all of these things that we're still blessed with. Um, I mean, I think sometimes we really do not realize how good we still have it and what we've all taken for granted. We have not resisted unto blood yet like so many others of our fellow believers uh, across the world. And we ought to have this new perspective as a believer that now I live a different agenda. Now I live a different program. Now I live a different kind of a life. And focusing upon the church of God is very much part of that. Vegetables, the safety and the security, the evidence of salvation, the safety and security of the believer. So important, amen? Now I want to move to the next food group, which is dairy. Dairy. Now this is a, a box of yogurt. I'm told yogurt is dairy, all right? <laughs> Apparently, it doesn't come from the store shelf. Apparently, yogurt is somewhere along the, uh, somewhere along the way made from cows. <clears throat> you know? Anyways. Um, dairy is, there's a lot of good nutrition in milk and milk products, right? For example, there's calcium, magnesium, and a lot of this other stuff in there that help us uh, build our bones, and that help us give our body some solid structure. And that's why a dairy, you know, unless of course we have digestive issues in regards to that, but generally speaking, dairy is an essential part of a healthy diet. And it, it helps us to give, give us stability and structure in our life. And I like to compare that to the discipline and the accountability that we find our church gives us. Dairy, the discipline and accountability. That, that structure uh, that we find. And uh, I want to, once again, stay in the book of Hebrews there in chapter 13, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Now, we're starting to get into a very unpopular part, but folks, it's the Bible. I didn't invent this. The Holy Spirit of God wrote this, amen? And so we're going to obey Him. He was, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, I said. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for those that like to make money from you and rule over you. I get always caught. That's not what it says, does it? For that is unprofitable for you, the scripture says, for me, it is unprofitable for you. Let me read this again. Again, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And so we see there is that oversight and, and that, that accountability and that discipline that needs to be enacted in every biblical church. And so that's where we find uh, 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 certain qualif qualifiers that when somebody lives in outright blatant sin and continues unrepentant in a lifestyle um, that is, 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 is the lifestyle of a complete unsafe person rather than what a, a child of God should live like, um, there, are, there are, are several sins that the Scripture points out to that qualify for church discipline. And we don't like that idea. And so I just only show up to church whenever I feel like. I just, 
Well, I just don't become part of the membership, so I don't have to be accountable. I don't have to be uh, part of, uh, you know, I can't be disciplined. And, and that is unscriptural. The discipline and the accountability that we have one to another as we, we fellowship is what helps us to glorify God better in our lives. As believer, we all, myself included, we all need the godly and loving oversight of God-called and biblically qualified pastors or under-shepherds under the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we, we see how uh, uh, the Holy Spirit says there, um, to take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, he says to the Ephesians pastors. Overseers. Bishop, that word in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that is referring to pastors there, that's what that word means. The word bishop means overseer. Somebody that has an oversight and an acts of discipline and acts of structure and an acts in accountability. You know, even the Lord Jesus Christ talked about that in Matthew chapter 18, a very familiar chapter, and, and so I let you study that out there for yourself, but it says that eventually, um, you know, uh, we, uh, there is a time where we need to bring certain issues uh, to the church. There's that accountability, that discipline aspect. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul in verse 12 and verse 13 makes it very clear that there's a difference between those that um, uh, are, are under the judgment, under the, the, the care and discipline of the church, and those that are judged without, which are under God's judgment. And so you, uh, you, you want to get in on that blessing. You want to get in on that special place of protection that is in the church. And not just that, though, we don't just have uh, accountability and, and, and a discipline to one another. We also have a accountability and responsibility to the Lord, don't we? In regards to how we treat the church of Jesus Christ. As a believer, I have a responsibility before God to be faithful to church, and I have an answer to Him about that. And so that's where we get to, once again, to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's a very simple command. Don't forsake the assembling. Amen? Our words... Whenever the assembly is assembling, you ought to be a part of it. <laughs> now, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, once again, let me read that verse. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So there is that accountability through the under shepherd, the pastor of the church. What does it mean to give an account? It means to give a reason or explanation for something, to justify something. And, um, you know, you, you say, well, what do you mean? So, so, in other words, the pastor is responsible for my Christian life? Well, not quite. Um, the Bible says that uh, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Amen? We just mentioned that earlier. So for the sake of illustration, I think the best way we could maybe explain this truth is, is, you know, something that I've experienced and I'm familiar with from my own family life. And so when we would ask someone uh, to uh, watch uh, uh, my children, uh, so, you know, my wife and I, can, let's say, can go on a date or something, um, uh, with, uh, and we would entrust our children to the care of that babysitter, and uh, our children know, and the babysitter also knows, that they, expect, they can expect when we come back, we will ask, how did things go? We want a report of our children's behavior, amen? And we want to know other things that need to be dealt with. And so I think similarly, when the Lord returns, 
um, the pastor uh, of, of each biblical church will give a report, will give an account. And God instructs us that it's better for us, that it's good for us to make sure that that is a, can be a joyful account. Oh, they love the Lord. Oh, oh, they were just such a blessing. Too. They were just always willing to serve, and they were excited, and they, they prayed, and, and, you know, they stayed on a straight and narrow, and, and on, oh, oh, well, they, they were just, just, just lashing out and hurting others. Oh, oh, it's just, oh, we prayed, oh, we tried, oh, we loved them, but they just wouldn't turn from that sin. And a report with grief. There's that accountability. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible teaches us. There's also the next food group, and that is proteins. Let me just grab this here. Anyone love meat? All right, I have a little sausage here in, in this bag. And there's some things that are very nourishing, that are very helpful, and that we experience in the church as well. Our, just like meat, is, is uh, very filling as a, um, a, a nourishment. We, you and I need to be nourished in the meat of the Word of God. And I believe that is talking about the training aspect of the church and, and the example that we find uh, uh, that we give one to another in the church. And I'm just quickly going to read some of these verses here for us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. You know, young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 was encouraged to, by Paul to be an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. And, um, and so we encourage one another. We influence one another. And most of you are probably not aware of the great power of influence that you have, for example, on, on, well, on me and even on my children. I could name you things that they're copying from some of you that are influencing them. Or some things that we've noticed that, you know, for example, they've been taught in Sunday school or so forth um, that, that uh, are godly things and, and that we're rejoicing in that some of you have influenced them in. And, and so that works for the young people just as for the older ones, amen, the adults. We are example one to another and we influence one another and we see, oh, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, or they're doing this or that in their life. Hmm. You know what? Yeah, yeah, I can see where they get that from the Bible. Wow, you know, you know, if they can do that, maybe we should try that. Um, you know, it seems the Lord is blessing them for this. Yeah, you know, maybe we can do this too. And so we influence one another. Um, but more so, there's also, of course, the training, the teaching aspect, amen? And um, uh, that's where, um, uh, once again, uh, that is a, a vital part of the church ministry uh, that we have to one, uh, toward another. And I uh, thought it was interesting how many times throughout the New Testament in particular we find again and again how um, we're supposed to be put into remembrance, how we remind ourselves uh, again and again and again of the teachings of the Scriptures. And I have a lot of these verses here um, that we can mention, but we don't have the time uh, this evening, uh, this morning, I mean. But um, again and again, the leaders of the church and the believers one towards another were supposed to remind each other of the Bible teachings, remind each other to live in godliness. And, and why? Once we heard it, isn't that enough? You know, after I've gone to church for about a year, I pretty much heard everything that guy has to say, so let's just move on. No, do you know why we need to keep coming to church each and every week? Until the day that, 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 that we die, or as long as we're physically able to? Because we forget. At least I do. I don't know about you, amen? <laughs> I certainly do forget. And so that's where even throughout the Scriptures, we're encouraged to constantly be reminded, to constantly put in remembrance, to constantly remind each other. And you, you know what? Yes, the church, to a degree, is a hospital for the spiritual sick, the hurting, and the needy. 
but it is also, and I believe probably first and foremost, in a sense, a sort of a boot camp, a, a training center for every Christian in the church to be equipped so that they're able to go out in the highway and byways and, uh, of this world to reach the lost and to declare and defend the message of the Bible. And so uh, the, we need to teach uh, one another. That is a vital aspect of why we get together. And that happens more than just, uh, you know, when my, one guy talks up front there somewhere. That happens as we interact with one another. That happens as we say, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, oh, the Lord just really blessed me with this verse this week. What the Lord teach you in your, in your walk with the Lord? Uh, what, what the Lord teach you this week? Nothing wrong with that question. It's not somebody to, to try to be a super spiritual Joe here or something. That is part of biblical Christianity. And to encourage one another that way. And, and influence one another towards love and good works in that way. And then lastly, we have the, the carbs, right? Uh, the, the, the food group of grain. And, and we're, we're pretty much done here. And so, you know, that's, that's your, your bread, your potatoes, your noodles, your rice, that sort of thing, right? And, um, uh, you know, that's where we find another aspect that is going to be very hard to live out as the Scripture commands us to without the church is uh, Christ's commandments in regards to the Lord's Supper and in regards to baptism. Amen? And so that's one more reason why the church and my faithfulness and my involvement to it is essential. Amen? It's essential. And so we see how just like in, in our, our, our physical food, amen, all the different aspects of our spiritual life um, that we are, depend upon for spiritual health, that we depend upon for a spiritual survival, matter of fact, are all connected to and in one way or another found in the gathering, the assembling together of the brothers and sisters of Christ under the teaching and preaching of God's Word, and praying together, worshiping the Lord together, interacting, fellowshipping, amen? And, and um, missing out on that is, is um, not just dangerous, it's, it's, it's also difficult to, to um, keep a spiritual vitality without some of these aspects. And that's why, folks, I believe it is important to teach and preach on that and take the time this morning for that because we need to rather move towards, closer towards the Lord and closer one towards another even so much the more. Amen? As Hebrews chapter 10 encourages us. And so once again, this is not to braid anyone, to make anyone feel guilty or any of that sort. This is just to encourage. This is to help and to instruct and, and for us to realize how much we depend upon the different aspects of, uh, of church and how essential it is for me to be there. Amen? And to, to be involved and to get this full nourishment into my diet. Amen? And so I um, just want to close with that this morning, and I encourage you right there where you are, in your home or wherever you're watching this, to just go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes, and uh, I'd like to encourage you, how has the Lord spoken to you this morning? What aspect of church did you need to be reminded of? What aspect of your faithfulness to church have you maybe not considered this uh, so essential and the Lord showed you how important it is this morning. As we just bow in prayer with eyes closed and heads bowed, it's just a matter between you and the Lord right now. Maybe I've been resistant to submit to that accountability, or may I dare say that discipline that a biblical church is supposed to have one toward another. Maybe I really haven't considered the fellowship and the faithfulness, the steadfastness really that important. I believe God wants to teach us this morning how essential your, my involvement is in the house of God. Let me ask you this this morning. Are you truly saved? 
Are you truly born again? I'm asking whether you've prayed some kind of a prayer or whether you believe certain things in your mind. The question rather is, have you experienced the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit of God and just simply turning to Jesus Christ in simple faith and repentance, relying only upon what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary for your salvation? It's natural for a Christian to desire to be with God's people. Father in heaven, we love you so much. And God, I thank you that you've given us one another. Lord, what would we do in this world without you, without your word, your Holy Spirit, but without your family? God, what would we do in this world without your church? And dear Lord, I pray that you would help us to really make your house an essential substance of our life of our spiritual diet. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly love one another as you've loved us, to serve one another in meekness and in, in, in graciousness. And Lord, most of all, to just desire to strive together with one mind and, and one mouth for the sake of the gospel and to see more people to be saved. Father, I pray you bless us. And Lord, you bring us back together uh, to, to assemble, to worship you and to encourage one another very soon, once again. And Father, we trust you for great and mighty things this week. Lord, I pray you'd help us to stay connected, especially as we see the day of your coming approaching. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, uh, appreciate your attention this morning, and I'll keep you updated in regards to uh, uh, what's all happening this week, and try to email you, and uh, God bless you.